All right, the chat is working. Folks are already introducing themselves. That's terrific. Um, and please feel free to do that. There's also a Q&A or a questions panel for you to use. And I think we will sort of re review um, what those are here shortly. Um, so as a few people are still dropping in, I am gonna turn it over to Nikki to introduce uh, the center and our uh, agenda for the day. Nikki, take it away. All right, great. Thanks, Eric. I am going to put the slide deck up for everyone. Give me one second to share that and begin the presentation mode. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, obviously, pop in the chat uh, if, if you're having trouble, but I think it's working. Um, so again, welcome to the Optimizing Research Collaboration for Remote Teams uh, webinar. We really are happy you're here and um, are excited to sort of share some insights and tips with you um, about how OSF could help meet some of these challenges. Um, so a little background. Um, uh, my slides aren't progressing. Oh, yeah, now they are. Okay, sorry. Um, a little background about the Center for Open Science, the organization that Eric and I both work for. Um, we are, uh, uh, we didn't actually properly introduce ourselves, so let me do that real fast. My name is Nikki Pfeiffer, I'm Director of Product at the Center, um, and Eric is also on the team as a product owner for our institutional uh, products. So um, the Center for Open Science has a mission to increase the openness, integrity, and reproducibility of research. We're a nonprofit organization, and we do develop our own um, platform that's open source and free for researchers. Um, that mission um, is an exciting one. Uh, we all enjoy spending our time every day advocating for open science um, and working towards a culture change. Our organization um, is built on three main pillars, and those pillars are policy, which uh, develops incentives um, and policies to embrace change, um, research to uh, gather the evidence of the change, and then infrastructure, which is the technology to enable this change. Um, as part of our mission, open science adoption and culture change is, is the end goal. Um, and that's something we work on and monitor every day. You may have seen this, um, sort of chart before of how culture change um, really does happen. Um, and so it begins early on with innovators moving towards the early adopters, majority, late majority, and then the laggards. When you take this um, and you actually kind of flip it on its side and look at the, the criteria that really it takes um, in, this, in this climate to make that change in culture, um, it's about establishing the infrastructure to make that possible. That's how you get the innovators really moving forward um, to create user interfaces and user experiences that really make it easy for someone to come in and begin these workflows um, and sort of have lower burdens to entry. Um, and then using communities to make it more normative, um, using incentives um, and policies to make it rewarding and required. Um, so when we talk about uh, this in the context of what the topic of our webinar is today about going remote, um, I think these are challenges we might all be facing. Um, so some of those critical high level challenges are sort of um, this low bandwidth communication. Um, we're used to being maybe more face to face and interactive with one another. And so moving to channels where you don't have quite as much interaction um, it's harder sometimes to pick up on cues and relay information the way that we used to. Um, also, passive knowledge sharing is something that um, happens when we are in um, common spaces at conferences and other places where we get to learn and pick up information from each other. And so now, where that's not possible, what are some ways we could still meet those goals um, using the tools available? Um, and obviously, tools. Tools are, are the way in which we're going to have to do this work online. And sometimes the tools might have gaps, or there might be new areas of, of knowledge that you need to learn about these tools. Um, and then the lack of organization and management of our, um, of our projects actually makes it harder to work through um, some of the, the milestones remotely. So we're going to talk about um, sort of how we can look at solutions for some of those challenges um, using the OSF uh, to manage some collaboration. Um, the keys there is that um, 
OSF is already built in uh, the value of being open and so it can help you get to more open practices just by um, moving some of your collaborations uh, into the OSF. Also, it has a, a lot of features that help with project management. And so one of the challenges was being organized and able to collaborate. So using OSF can help uh, ease some of those burdens. And then lots of different workflows that you might be trying to manage with all your different collaborators in different um, areas. And so um, there's a lot of features within the OSF on collaboration um, and managing your teams and access and permissions to, to content and files. So we can talk about how that works and uh, demonstrate a little bit of that to you too. And then the other couple areas we want to uh, spend some time on is the versatile wiki. Uh, this is a very underutilized uh, sort of feature on the OSF and um, we've we've got a lot of creative people out there that have used the wiki to solve uh, some of their uh, workflow challenges and are using it um, very effectively and so I think we'll look at the diverse features uh, because maybe there's new use cases we haven't even thought of and some of you might see those features and come up with those um, but then to also sort of illustrate a lot of those use cases for you and how others have used it to solve problems like electronic lab notebooks or online courses, um, syllabi, different things like that. And then lastly, just looking at the OSF institutions product because it does sort of sit above um, projects and allow you to aggregate and maximize sort of the visibility of that project work, um, increasing your collaboration and communication sort of across teams. Um, and lastly, we really, um, we, we really want to hear from you. And so one of the uh, features of Zoom that we're excited to, uh, to kind of bring forward here is the use of the polling function. And so uh, in just a second, I'll turn it over to Eric to kind of show you how that will work. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, we'd like you to answer those questions sort of in this early period while we're talking, um, and then we're going to use those responses to help inform some of the use cases that we highlight because you're telling us that those are more relevant to you. Okay, Eric, do you want to talk any more about the, the poll? Yeah, I, I just launched it, Nikki, so it should be, oh, and, and I'm seeing responses come in, so it is available and being voted on already. Awesome, great. So let us know if you have questions about uh, about the poll, either in the Q and A or in the in the chat. Um, just just keep uh, responding and sort of giving us some insights. Okay, so I'm going to start to dive in a little bit to um, to the 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 overarching principles here of organizing research. Um, and managing files. Uh, to do this, uh, this is a little bit of an overview of some of the things I'm going to touch on. Uh, just quickly hitting on some of the file features that the OSF has built in. Uh, take a quick peek at Quick Files, which is a is a is a feature of the OSF that you may not have noticed is 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 there and has some added value. Also, to look at how OSF projects um, features sort of work in different scenarios for collaborative. Um, team management um, and looking at management of collaborators and um, the project that is linked on your screen um, I, is going to be the one I'm going to be using for demonstration and we will make it public so you can also um, explore some of the content there. I'm going to quickly stop that so that I can hop over to the project. Uh, let's see. So real quick, um, I'm assuming everyone can still see my screen. And I will turn my project public, which is a great uh, demonstration of the first parts of project management, which is being able to create a project in, um, in a default privacy, private mode, um, which allows you to do, you know, your work in a private setting if that's of interest, but then to also make it public when you're ready. So I'm gonna make it public now um, so that you all, if you would like to um, go to that URL, um, 43Z28 to also be uh, exploring the project as I, as I am sort of walking through it as well. Um, so real quick, um, one of the things about um, the OSF and um, projects and files uh, that we've recently um, added is the ability when you create a new project to um, select from the uh, storage location um, 
from these four choices. So this allows teams across the globe to move the file storage that's native in the OSF um, to whatever location makes the most sense for them. So our current locations um, are United States and that'll be the one that is done by default. So if you don't actually open this and change it, then it's gonna keep it there. But we also have um, Frankfurt, Germany, Montreal, Canada, and Sydney, Australia. I just wanted to show you that real fast and I think it'll um, help as, as you think about using this in your own applications. But right now, um, you're looking at uh, the project for this uh, webinar um, that we'll also use to illustrate some of the features. And um, right now, I'm looking at my project overview page, and I have um, already put some files in here so that we can look at them through demonstration. But first and foremost, I want to show you that um, OSF storage um, is going to be, be there from the beginning because that's our native storage. And um, when, you, when you select it, you can start to begin some of your file operations. You can upload files, you can create folders, you can download and download a zip. Um, I've already created um, this file um, and uploaded it so that we could, we could begin to look at it. Um, this is what it looks like when you uh, look at a file. And um, one, of the, one of my favorite parts of, of the OSF is that files, um, from over 500 different file types and formats actually render directly in the browser. Um, so this is exciting. Um, there are lots of different research use cases where there are 3D files and step files and lots of dynamic imaging files. And for the most part, the OSF will support that. If you happen to discover one that isn't supported, we're always interested in um, adding addi additional um, file formats here. So just reach out and let us know. Um, but one of the um, one of the main uh, features that I like to look at here is the ability to look at the different uh, versions of a file and the version history. Um, and one of the things you might notice about this file that's sitting below the file we're currently looking at is called osffilefeatures.txt. So the, the actual text of this file is in bold. That is a um, unread uh, file update notification. So because this file is, is bold, that means that one of my collaborators has actually gone in and made an edit to this file. And that alerts me to say, oh, something's changed with this file. So I can go in and look at this file um, and I would then be able to see what's changed. And if I'm not sure what changed, because it doesn't seem obvious to me, I can actually go to the revision history um, and I could go back and look at the previous version and compare it to the new version um, and see the difference. So that's, um, that's some of the native um, file versioning functionality that's built in that helps when you're doing collaboration across teams. When you've got a lot of people engaged in a project and working through the files um, and making changes and updates, it's really exciting to be able to um, keep track of those in a really easy way. The other um, way in which you could do that is to look through the project logs. So in the project, you can, you can see that um, different folks have done different actions on this file and I can go back to the very beginning and see those updates being made. Um, one of the other things about the OSF that's um, really great for collaborations is the ability to connect additional storage providers. So in, the, in, in that meaning you can connect any one of the like 11 that we've built integrations with. Um, and what makes it really you know, easy, you just, you just authenticate in and then I can connect my folder um, from any one of my storage providers. So if I worked with Google Drive um, and wanted to connect um, one of my Google Drive uh, folders, I just import um, my, uh, my credentials and then it shows me all the different, um, all the different file folders that I have in my, um, in my drive and I can connect those. Um, some of these uh, probably aren't good to connect, but I can and disconnect them as well. Um, it's just as simple as that. And when you do that, they're rendering right there in the project. Um, and it, it doesn't, it, it simplifies that workflow even more, meaning that um, perhaps Eric and I are, co are collaborating on this project, but he doesn't have um, a Dropbox account or a GitHub account. And that way, um, because I do, um, I can connect that and Eric doesn't actually need to make an account. Everything that I bring into the project and I add him as a collaborator with permissions and whether I break that into just read access or read write, he can do those same functions on those files as if he were part of, um, part of that tool. 
all of the a lot of the tools uh, do support version history um, in some regard, meaning um, if you change things over in in Google Drive or um, even here on the OSF, the versions will keep in sync. Um, let's see other main functions just to just to run through real fast is um, also renaming files and folders is very simple you just um, highlight that file and you can see the functions are up here and I can type in and rename it very easily um, also moving and copying across um, different components um, which I haven't shown you how components work but when I do I'll demonstrate that as well but you can move um, and copy files across that structure which um, sometimes is really great if you've got a file in a main project and then you decide you want to build more structure and move files around um, to prevent access um, from some pieces of your project work. Um, one of the things too um, worth mentioning is that we have had several community uh, developed packages that work with the OSF. One that I'd just like to mention quickly is the OSF client. So this was a community uh, written um, uh, command line uh, program package that talks to the OSF and allows you to programmatically um, upload and download files, which may be of interest if um, some of the other tools that you're working from need to, to work with data and do additional analysis steps and then want to push back the final, the final pieces. Um, okay, so um, the other thing too is um, all projects allow you to mint a DOI. So the, the files within it could be referenced um, from that, that same DOI, um, if that was of interest. Um, okay, the other uh, quick, um, quick is the best word for this, um, quick tool I wanted to show you also here. Sometimes you don't need to build a whole project structure. You literally have one file that you want to share with one other collaborator or multiple other collaborators. And that's really easy to do by clicking on your quick files. And every user on the OSF gets a quick files um, component within their uh, account. And so it's, it's very easy to quickly upload um, and download files and um, and also to share them. So you can quickly share the files um, with others. You can see you still get the version history uh, parts of um, parts of the OSF file. So it's, um, it's a really neat, versatile tool. Um, and I think um, the next level to this would be to move these files into a project. And that's actually really easy to do. It's just a click of a button. Um, moving them, you just create the project on the fly. So if, if you just wanted to start with this and see if there's interest in collaboration and then move it into the project and add collaborators that way, um, that workflow is, is very easily supported. So um, I think that's uh, one feature that maybe folks didn't realize um, was part of the OSF. Um, okay, the next part that I'd like to just dive into a little bit is the OSF um, as a whole and the project structure and hierarchical um, sort of accesses that are in here. Ah, kick it back. Sorry, okay. Um, so this is uh, a top level project that we're using for demonstration, but what uh, could be done here, um, and I'll just talk through a few examples, um, is, is the addition of components um, that will help you sort of break out the files and add more structure. Um, so I can quickly add a new component. Um, I might call this one um, data because I know I'm going to be collecting data as part of my example here. Um, I can choose a storage location that's different from the project. Maybe my data um, is actually going to be collected in the, in the EU, and so I want to make sure that um, that data is easily uh, you know, accessed from folks in, in the EU and put my storage over in Germany. Um, you can do that. You can also easily add the collaborators that you had on the main project by just checking this box and the same with the tags. It will also inherit the license that you have on the project, um, but you don't have to. Um, you can leave those unchecked. Um, so when you create this new component, you're given the choice to either um, keep working where you are and make more components and build more structure or go to the new component. When you do this, um, 
one thing you'll notice is that it literally looks like the the project the only difference is that now you've got this relationship of sort of a breadcrumb and a nesting this means that this component has all its own unique title contributors um, description it can have its own license it gets its own wiki it's still related to the original project but you do have the opportunity to kind of customize this as you need and so one of the things that um, is important here is to look at who um, who I'm collaborating with in the privacy study. So um, for this, I've made the project public, but my data component is actually private. One, it's private by default, which is the way that OSF works. But um, also, I may decide that the data isn't something I'm quite ready to share, or I may have privacy or security to, to manage within that data set. So I don't really want to make that public right now or ever. And that's totally fine. Um, but I may make another component for analysis and connect my GitHub repo and put in my analysis scripts. Um, and therefore, I'm sharing um, publicly with other researchers and able to collaborate on my project, maybe on my analysis. Um, if I made a pre-registration, that's something that would be there too that I could collaborate with um, others about. Um, so if I look at adding um, collaborators now, this is um, some of what um, I think is is really great about the OSF's um, structure. First of all, I can add new I can add new collaborators really easily. I can search for them um, if they happen to have uh, an OSF project or an OSF profile already built in. I can see that this is another version of me that I'm going to add to the project, and I can choose. Um, what permissions to give. And so the breakdown is that an admin um, is someone that um, basically has control over the project, is able to change the, the settings of private, private or public, is able to manage the contributor list and create view only links. They can delete the project, they can register the project. Um, and then there's also read write. Read write has a little lower permissions, but still can do a lot of collaboration. They can add and edit con content, they can add and configure components, um, they can collaborate on draft registrations. Um, and then read users are um, able to view the project content and also to comment on aspects of the project using the commenting feature. So I'm going to add this person as we write. The other thing to point out is non-bibliographic um, is, is an option as well. So meaning bibliographic, they would be in the citation and listed on the, on the front page of the project as a contributor. And non-bibliographic would mean they wouldn't be, um, but they still have access to all of the, the project contents depending on what level of permission you give them. Um, I can also select when I add a new contributor which component, um, what parts of the project structure I want to give them access to. I don't have a really robust structure here, but if I did, I'd be able to go all the way through all of the nesting and the components and decide which ones I want to give um, Nikki, in this case, access to. Um, right now, I'm only going to give access to the top level and leave my data still um, just with me. Just below that, you'll see um, this section that's called request access. Um, this is great because this project um, was private to begin with, um, but you can still do this with public projects as well. This takes somebody who maybe is just viewing a public project and allowing them to actually be a collaborator um, and listed as a contributor. Um, and create components depending on what permission level you give them. So Eric's asked um, to be a, um, member of my project and um, by default it's going to just give them read access but i've decided that i think eric should be um, administrator as well because he might need to do some additional functions on this project so by doing that i can click add and he will actually get moved up to the contributor list um, above and now eric has permission to come in and do things i also have another one here um, and I can certainly give folks um, additional um, permission. And if anybody else wants to join the project, um, welcome to request access. Um, the, the last um, sort of collaboration contributor management function that I like to talk about is view only links. Um, view only links are kind of a neat thing that allow you to give out a link to your, um, to your project. And this could be in definitely a private state. Um, for peer review or other types of open or blind review. And so um, by doing this, I can name my link um, and you know, peer review for journal A. 
So that, um, and this one's not blind, so I don't need to anonymize my contributor list. And um, I am gonna give this link access to the data. Um, so if I were to share that link, anyone with the link would be able to come in and look at the project and look at the data component. Um, and you can see that right here, and it's really easy to take it and share that, you know, copy that to your clipboard and paste that into an email or anything else to, to share. Um, the other thing is, um, I can also decide when it's time to stop allowing access, and so I can delete that link um, and know that anybody with that link would not be allowed to access my project any longer. Um, I think that is a good start on some of these. Um, I'm hoping to, to kind of see some of the feedback and there's definitely more use cases that we could get into. Um, and I think Eric is going to maybe jump in and try to show you around the wiki a little bit. So I am going to turn off my share and give it over to Eric. Thanks, Nikki. So I, before we jump into the poll, I have a, a few questions here specifically about storage. So that we uh, hand those to you. Okay. Um, so uh, Nitsan has asked if there's a way for OSF storage to sync uh, with some a storage on their desktop uh, without the use of add-ons. Unfortunately, there's not. Um, that was a project we were thinking about um, and actually did do a small implementation on a long time ago, but right now we don't have a desktop client uh, for syncing. You could use the uh, client, uh, the command line that I talked about um, and probably upload files from that directly to your OSF project. That would be the only way. Okay, um, and then how much file storage is available per user? Um, right now it's unlimited. Um, it is something we're looking at for cost mitigation strategies, um, but at this time there's there's no limit. Okay, I'm going to take one more here. Um, so you would showed us a little bit about how the nested components work and how permissions might work in there. Um, if I wanted to have a component data that a private data component and then two subcomponents with one being private and one being public, would that work? That would work. Again, each component has its own sort of set of um, privacy and contributor management. So um, it is totally av available to be unique from the rest. All right. Thank you, Nikki. So I am going to share the results of the poll that you have all been taking a look at and working on, um, and we will come back to some of these other uh, questions and thoughts. So we're not uh, gone forever from those, um, but we will look here at a few of your uh, responses to these just you know, broad questions, um, and then we'll look at a couple of use cases based on this that may answer some of those questions that you have already. So we had asked, um, based on your experiences over the last couple of months or, or maybe even before that, um, did you describe your primary uh, collaborative projects? So those that your faculty or stakeholders um, are most involved in. We do have a little bit of everything here um, with uh, many answering that uh, they are working on, on collaborative ways to do data management planning and compliance as well as uh, research teams that may be across campus or across disciplines. So that is something we will take a look at shortly. Um, we also asked how you feel the research collaborations have been impacted recently. And I, I think uh, this is probably not a surprise that uh, for the vast majority has at least been impacted to, to some degree, if not significantly. Um, and then uh, we did ask uh, what you found to be the most significant barrier. And there are probably uh, many uh, responses to this question um, that we didn't even anticipate here. Uh, and we did get a little bit of every response here um, with uh, almost half responding to both to lack of communication, project management and uh, organizing project materials. Um, so hopefully we have sort of started at least um, to look at a few ways we, uh, the OSF can, can help with a few of those things. 
So with that in mind, uh, let's jump forward and, and look at one of those other resources that, uh, that Nikki mentioned um, that is, it accompanies all, all of those OSF projects and components um, and can help to provide context guidance or, or more than that um, based on what your use cases are. And that is uh, the wiki. So I'll tell you a little bit about the wiki and then we'll look at a few uh, use cases that I've put together. Um, so the wiki is that uh, component, that portion of the a project that Nikki um, shared with us that on its face kind of just looks like a, an open text field, um, but it, it is designed to allow it to be more than just a, a description. Um, it actually is a pretty powerful tool that can allow you to, to describe and, and link things in your projects. Uh, so among the things that the wiki uh, enables, um, it can be collaboratively uh, managed and edited. Um, so your projects or your wikis don't have to be, you know, you have to worry about two people working on it at the same time. Nikki and I could be working on those uh, wikis simultaneously. Um, and providing that kind of information with the wiki provides context for their uh, data. So um, I mentioned the collaborative simultaneous editing that is using Markdown. So it's um, a tool that's fairly easy to use and is somewhat uh, guided already within the tools that's offered um, in the OSF. And I'll show you uh, in a briefly uh, in a moment. And there's also within the wikis or within the projects uh, permission levels that um, you can have uh, just your contributors managing those uh, wikis, but if you wanted um, the broader community to contribute to your to wiki, your wiki to add resources or stories or um, whatever the case may be, that is something you can enable without having to open up other parts of your project. You wouldn't have to make your components all editable by the community, but you can have that wiki be, or a wiki, um, be accessible and editable by the public. And then even if, you sort of anticipated a risk to that um, and there were changes that you didn't you wouldn't want reflected on your public version of your project uh, all of the versions of those wikis are saved um, so if someone went and erased all your data for some reason in your wiki it's not gone um, there would be a version that uh, of your last your edits would still be there um, so you're not uh, at loss of of um, losing all of your, at risk of losing all of your data. Uh, so with that, let us take a look. I'm going to navigate over to uh, the project we were just on that Nikki was showing us earlier. And I have, uh, since she added me as a contributor to the project, I now have the ability to create and link things that uh, I couldn't before. Uh, one of those is uh, I've linked a few projects here. It's in addition to the component that uh, Nikki already created within our project. I've linked a few new ones uh, that are very, very basic um, uh, templates for the, some of these uh, responses that you've given us in the polls. Um, so we do have a wiki for the project. This one we use as a sort of a broad introduction um, to this event. Uh, so there's not a whole lot uh, going on here. So we're going to go bounce right over to one of our use cases and look at the wiki there and some of these features that uh, we've just described. So this is, uh, a, as I mentioned, a very, very basic template uh, that I've put together from uh, that would be uh, designed to help research teams organize all of the, the data that you know, maybe five, 10, 20 different people are doing different parts of a project um, with some structure that doesn't have to be unmanageable. Um, and the wiki can be a way to guide teams toward uh, the resources that they need or the places that they need to store or manage their, 
data uh, within uh, the OSF. So here is our, our wiki here, and this is a, the view that anyone would see, this public view here, and we have a number of things that uh, are unique. We have some header text, we have some images, and some embedded videos. So we'll look at uh, the editing interface uh, and how some of that is done. And I mentioned that Markdown is the uh, tool that enables um, all of these customizations. Um, and you can see, let me zoom in a little bit, see if this is, make our text a little bigger. Um, you can see some of the, the tools that are enabling things like um, header text is, is all pretty straightforward, just these, these double pounds here. Um, and then the perhaps more interesting, if I can scroll down again, is when we get to the images that uh, we're in the design section, it's right here. And so this is uh, linked from elsewhere, and we can see our uh, links down here. Uh, and so image links, we actually have a tool for that right in the interface. So you don't have to memorize any markdown syntax in order to use that. You can just use this tool here to add your images. And then you can also um, add uh, videos. You can embed videos uh, with the same uh, syntax in here. I've got it somewhere that I've added them in here, right here. Um, so it's a really pretty easy syntax. And we've linked uh, the, a guide to um, the more complex um, elements of that grammar um, here in the tools so that I can help you with uh, sort of managing those things. But within the wiki here, um, I'm going to leave the editing mode and then we can look at the version history because I've messed with this throughout the day. We have this public version here and then we can compare that to um, a version from earlier today, probably not uh, a whole lot different. Um, I've removed a few things and added that YouTube uh, embedded video here. And then, so this would, it could have dozens of versions for these wikis and you'd be able to compare those to the current public version. You can actually have the edit uh, column open all at the same time if that would be helpful for updating your uh, wikis for your teams so that it, it continues to be a resource for them. Um, and then within, uh, in, in this project, I've created a number of components which would, uh, for a, a team with a complex data gathering process, perhaps would help to uh, sort of guide them to uh, resources for those particular areas. So data related to their experiment, they have grant resources, they need to be managed. Those who have components, particularly for those, and each of those components will also have a wiki that can likewise provide guidance um, for that particular area uh, for the research team. And then within each of these, you can have multiple components. I think I do have one with multiple components that I can show you in a moment. Um, so that is what the, the markdown editing process uh, looks like. And then to have your, uh, you can do other things with your, your wiki. You could even disable your wiki if you really have a project that doesn't need that or it has really just a landing page for your data. You can disable that wiki. It won't appear on your project at all. Um, as uh, we mentioned earlier, you can uh, control who can edit that wiki. So I can have all users of the OSF uh, be able to contribute to this, I don't know if you can see this drop down, but um, can contribute to this wiki. Um, so all they would need is to be able to log into the OSF in order to contribute to that. Um, and then you can also delete these wiki pages. If you have something that's clearly out of date um, that is no longer needed, I just can't delete the home page. Let me go to uh, my other one that I've created for us which is about data management, which has a few other wiki features that were not in the research teams one, including having an extra uh, wiki here, which doesn't have 
anything in it. It's just an empty wiki here, but just to demonstrate our multiple wikis for any project or component, if I no longer need that, that uh, wiki, I can remove it. And then, um, so as far as unique areas to, to data management or um, areas that researchers would need to highlight in the data management plan that may be a little different than others um, would be generally sort of answering these, these questions um, before their research takes place, how they intend to collect and, and manage and use and store their data um, and they can, provide those here and then also link to the resources that are uh, relevant to those responses. So they can link across their project as we've um, shown before, those different components can have different focal points. They can link to um, protocols or supplements in their um, components. And I'll show that list here in a moment. You can link to existing or describe existing data that you're using. If you have something that visualizes the way that you're going to use or store your data, I think it's always pretty useful. Um, you can embed files that are from the OSF into uh, your uh, into your wiki, which has a. This is all it takes. There, if you have something that's stored on your OSF uh, account, um, really you just use the the GUID, which I think uh, Nikki. Um, sort of described what uh, the GUIDs are for OSF files, um, and those will embed in the project. This would be if there were, you know, 100 slides, it would still embed in here just like that. And then if you have compliance or, or legal issues that you need to describe about uh, your data, you, that can also be formatted uh, in a table so that it's easily um, described and understood um, for you know, if this was sent to your funders or to your compliance um, offices and your in at the university it would have all of these details included you could link to the data itself once it's uh, provided and uh, the markdown for tables is uh, pretty straightforward uh, so let me go back to the project itself and we'll look at the different components. So as I mentioned, this is, I wouldn't use this as your template. I've linked to examples uh, that would be much better for that. Um, but just to pr provide a sense, um, you could have uh, guide drawer researchers to create a, a plan that has components um, that instead of, of dumping all of their, of their data or the resources relative to how they're going to collect and store their data into one place where it's difficult to describe or discover any of that material. They can have those separate components for the particular area. So for their protocols, it can have its own component um, for their notes. And then each of these will have all of the same features as um, an OSF project. Well, those, each of those components, We'll have its own wiki, we'll have the ability to add components, contributors, the same as uh, we've seen with the projects. I think we're running close to time here, so I, I'm not going to describe or not going to walk through the other ones that I've created, but I will link them all to the project so that you can take a look at those um, later. Um, so if you're not, so it's not what I meant to hit. So quickly, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, OSF institutions, which Nikki did uh, mention a little bit, and some of the challenges that we hear from institutions in, in talking to them about their data management and research communication challenges, um, sort of generally across you know, 50, 60 research institutions that we've talked to and worked with pretty closely. Um, is that they find that researchers can be um, burdened by reporting processes and that's not just a university to researcher issue. They have to report to all kinds of different bodies, you know, all of their funders, um, sometimes to uh, publishing journals um, for conflict of interest, all kinds of things that are not uh, 
terribly well channeled. The infrastructure is, is not consistent for those things in most cases. The tools, if there are tools for some of those uh, services or, or needs, um, there's not just one, there's many, many tools and they're proliferating um, so that researchers have difficulties keeping up with what's available to them and likewise to the research support services. As we mentioned, meeting those compliance requirements um, and being able to communicate that you've met those requirements is pretty difficult and that's on behalf of the researchers themselves as well as the university communicating that their their researchers are compliant. And then insufficient data about what the researchers are doing that don't involve uh, end of the line publications. Um, that can be very difficult to track, but it's also very important to communicate that your researchers are uh, using best practices, have rigorous uh, research practices, but it's difficult to do if you don't, if you can't see or, or understand what they're working on. Um, so OSF institutions is, is a, uh, a fee-for-service membership model that uh, provides all of those things that the OSF, all of those things we've looked at today for the, the researchers is still free for those researchers to sign up for an account that hasn't changed. Um, but what we do want to provide is, is more uh, insight, more information for the institutions that um, are supporting those researchers in their work. Um, so all of, if all of this interesting work is happening at, um, at your institution, then you would probably want to know, um, and we want to help you get that information. So we've developed a number of these features, particularly to support the researchers themselves or help you to support them, as well as to give you more information. So there's a, a single sign-on feature, which um, I'll show you in a second what that looks like, but it allows your researchers, instead of creating a whole new account and new credentials they have to keep track of at the OSF, they sign in with your uh, email address and password. Um, a branded aggregate page which collects all of that public information. So if those projects that your researchers are developing are public, all of those would be aggregated on a page just for your university and, and their work. Um, training that is particularly um, uh, focused on helping your researchers adopt or accelerate those practices or to, to help your research support staff support them in that uh, pursuit. Uh, opportunity to integrate your own local or cloud storage tools into the OSF, those that you have on campus that are unique to you instead of attempting to add more and more tools, integrate some of those together, uh, and make them interoperable. And then finally, administrative tools uh, that provide even more information about all of that work that your researchers are doing and even providing insights by department or teams uh, based on what kind of information we can get technically. So our goal is to focus on allowing your researchers to spend time doing research uh, and less time you know, with them trying to, to do the administrative components or, or negotiate all of the different tools that they're being asked to use. So very quickly, I am gonna go right back to the same project that we were just looking at. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, I think on the projects we were looking at before, you can kind of see a Center for Open Science uh, logo up top. And that is not native to every project on the Open Science Framework. That is, uh, was added because of our uh, Nikki's and my affiliation to uh, the center. And this was our project. So this is an existing project. If I go to my settings as the contributor, there is a, a question here about adding an affiliation to this project. And scroll back down here. And I have two uh, affiliations that I have um, are added to my account by way of my email and credential information, as I mentioned before the the Center for Open Science, as well as uh, George Mason University, where I've had a, a posting before. And if I want to affiliate this project, this data management template, with the center, you can add this affiliation and the components 
um, affiliation. And when I go back to the front page here, we'll see this logo appear. And if there are, you know, five contributors that all have affiliations at, you know, four or three, four or five different universities, if all of those are members of OSF institutions, they can all attribute their uh, affiliation to this project. And then uh, the center and all of the OSF institution members have an aggregate page that collect all of these projects that have added an affiliation uh, to it. So in this case, the most recent one, uh, or actually several of these today, are all affiliated with Nikki and I, uh, as well as with the center. So on our branded center aggregate page here, um, all of these public projects are available, visible. Anyone can navigate to these and see all of the, the cool stuff that we're doing here at the Center for Open Science. So any of the members would have information just like this one. And when I go to create a new project, these affiliations will be on by default. So make it very easy for a researcher to affiliate their information with uh, their university, with their institution. Um, so that is some of the, mm, excuse me, Oh, let me show you a sign in real quick. Um, when your users are logging in for OS, OSF institutions members, they have uh, an additional sign in option um, that we will see here. Um, so for all of the OSF institutions option, uh, uh, members, they will appear as a sign in option for the sign in through your institution uh, drop down. And so there's about 65 members of OSF institutions now. Um, any institution can join uh, and make their uh, single sign on information available to their users. So it won't be available to just any institution, um, but rather to members of this group. Um, and we would help, we would set this up for you we may need a little help from you but this is not something that you have to go and build and integrate yourselves um, we would help set this up for you um, so that's a very quick tour of osf institutions and we just have a few minutes left so i'm going to um, turn it over to you um, i have a few questions uh, still here on our list um, but then any questions, thoughts, feedback that you have in our last few minutes, please do uh, submit those so that we can continue to talk and then we'll um, talk a little bit about how we can keep this conversation going. Um, so I have a question here. Oh, never mind. I think the question was been answered by Nikki, who's quicker than I am. Um, so any other thoughts, questions, uh, please do drop them in that uh, Q&A uh, box that you have available there or um, thoughts about any of those use cases or additional use cases that we haven't anticipated. Please do um, tell us about that. Uh, Lisa is asking if, uh, can you make copies of the template created? Um, actually, one of the very neat features and something that uh, I was using heavily to sort of create a super basic um, templates were is a um, is exactly that um, you can create temp templates of projects that uh, you want to have the structure from um, so with something like this this is our little research teams one um, if you want to have the not the wiki information or the specific data but the way they structured these components, um, oh, gonna sign in first. Um, you can do that with uh, either fork the project, if this, this is a project yourself or you're working on with them, but you can also uh, duplicate the template of this project, which is only gonna bring over um, the, the structure of this OSF project. So this is actually something really very neat if you find um, an example of, a data management or research project uh, structure that you've found here, um, 
you don't need to go and copy and paste their components or their um, the structure of their project. You just need to use this uh, duplicate template. And I get it. this now is a project that I've created. I'm the contributor, has my affiliations on it, and it brings over all of the, the structure, the components of that project. So that's a very good question. Um, and uh, yes, indeed, you can create templates of of these projects today, but of course, any others as well. Um, lost my question panel here. So I get it back. Uh, okay, I have some students doing their research projects. It is possible for them to publish their research proposals um, with uh, the USF. Um, so actually, there's a few options there. Maybe Nick, you tell them a little bit about uh, preprints and, and how that works or maybe is an option for them. Yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, so OSF actually operates about 27 different preprint servers, many of which are managed and operated by communities um, and they're discipline specific, but some are actually um, global and, and specific to a country or a region. So um, I can, uh, if you go to osf.io slash preprints, I think you could go there and explore what um, what the different server options are. I'm not sure what discipline um, you're working in and what your students might actually be most applicable to for some of their research projects, but they could certainly submit a preprint there. Um, the communities are actually moderating those and deciding what um, fits within their editorial guidelines and what doesn't. I will say that OSF preprints is the one that Center for Open Science actually operates um, and we do not moderate so you could certainly submit um, to our uh, preprint repository and they would be accepted and, and, there, and therefore get a DOI and be citable. Um, there's also thesis commons so if their research projects are more like theses or, or dissertations you could you could also uh, consider submitting to um, thesis commons for that. Awesome. Thank you, Nikki. Um, so Paul has asked about uh, the costs for OSF institutions. Um, so that is, uh, we have a new website for OSF institutions that is right around the corner. Um, right now, um, I have this information in uh, institutions has its own OSF project. We like to walk the walk there. Um, and one of the the elements is an agreement for services, which has all of the, the, the details um, of how the a membership with OSF institutions works, including um, the tiers. We've created tiers so that um, your institution gets what it needs right now, um, instead of trying to, to negotiate how this might work. You don't want to get services that you're never going to use. Um, so we've created these, these tiers um, so that you can find exactly the services that are relevant to you and where your institution is right now. Um, and that's something that uh, you and I can, can chat about, Paul. And um, I'm going to drop a link to this file in particular, but this is also linked in the slides. Um, so this is something that we can, uh, any of you, please, please contact me to chat about this. And I'm happy to talk about your context uh, for your institutions. Um, there is a question from Wynn here. Is there a plan to add functionality journals have like reviewing publications, formatting services uh, to the OSF? Um, so I, I think part of that might be answered. Uh, as Nikki mentioned, there are many different preprint services um, on the OSF and some of those have moderation. Um, so I, if that's what you mean by uh, reviewing, um, that is something that each of those communities uh, can do. They don't all uh, use moderation, but some of them do. Um, so that uh, is something that is a community by community decision. Um, formatting services, I probably not. Um, I think that um, would be up to the, the researchers and the communities themselves. If they decide format that if something comes in is not appropriate, then they would you know, tell that author to, to make changes. But the OSF itself um, is not going to make those demands. We've 
actually are very proud of how flexible uh, the tool is in terms of formats and, and file types and those kind of things. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Wim. Um, and one other question, how to, oh, I think you already got it. Uh, cool, well, we are right to, directly on time. So I'm gonna sign off here with just a, a word about how to keep talking to us. We want to, to keep hearing from you and talk to you, um, not just at you, but we wanna hear from you and what you're working on and what is important to you. Um, so I have a few different things here and there are many other ways you could get involved, but these are a few that we talked about today. Um, so if you want to talk about institutions, whether you, you might not be ready for membership or you want to talk about what that involves or you might not be anywhere near that, I still would like to talk to you uh, about what you have going on um, and, and what your priorities and needs and pain points are. Um, so please come write to me and we will chat. Um, the, there is also an OSF ambassador program. I don't think we talked about that today, um, but we do have resources about the ambassadors. If you are interested in, in talking about the USF at in, your institution, um, you can also write to my colleague Claire, who's also here today, um, to talk about the ambassador program. Um, you can attend future webinars. We have very many different topics. We don't do the same event every time. Um, so take a look at our webinars page, there's at least one that's in the next few weeks, um, and we always have new things getting added. Uh, so keep a watch there or on social media um, to see what new events are coming. Uh, probably not any in-person events anytime soon, so keep a lookout for the web events. Um, if you have a, if you saw an OSF project today that um, you're interested in uh, being involved in in some way, um, either write to the, the author of that project, or if it's something that's at the USF for the center itself, uh, you can write to, to the product team or to me uh, to chat about that. Uh, and then training, uh, whether it's part of an institution's membership or, or something separate, um, I've linked to resources about training here. Um, and then if you're just not sure how you wanna stay involved, but you do wanna stay involved, um, just write to us, uh, we wanna to talk to you. So. Um, please don't hesitate to, to write us or tweet us or whatever is easy for you. Uh, we will find a way to, to chat with you. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and uh, Nikki, do you have anything to add? No, I appreciate everybody coming and we hope to continue talking through email or otherwise. Terrific. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, keep a lookout for a follow-up. We'll have these uh, resources and a recording, I believe, of the session. Um, so you won't leave anything behind when you leave today. Um, and yeah, let's let's talk in the future. And thank you for coming.